Hey everybody, tonight's video is called The Deliverance of Israel. And tonight we continue our pass-through study here in the book of Isaiah. We're going to be looking at the ordering of the kingdom. And so Isaiah chapter 27 verse 1 starts out, In that day the Lord will, will his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, the twisting serpent. And he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. And uh, in that day speaks of the day of judgment here. And Leviathan is a multi-headed serpent found a few times in the Old Testament to denote evil in the autocratic powers as seen in Psalm 74 verse 14 and Isaiah chapter 30 verse 7. And behind earthly tyrants is satan and we know from genesis 3 verse 1 through 5 that satan is referred to as a serpent and isaiah prophesies the ultimate defeat of satan when the kingdom of the messiah conquers all in verse 2 through 6 it says in that day sing to her a vineyard of red wine i the lord keep it i water it every moment lest any hurt it i keep it day and night Fury, fury, fury is not in me. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together or let them take hold of my strength. That he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Those who come, he shall cause to root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the whole world with fruit so these verses of vineyard is identified with israel in, ver in verse 3 god's future provisions for restored israel will be complete and in verse 4 it shows us for israel's punishment god will pass and we see briars and thorns point to the enemies of the people and the Lord is ready to forgive and reconcile people to himself. And in verse 5, shows us the enemies of Israel make peace with God. And in verse 6, in the future kingdom of the Messiah, restored Israel will rule with him and fill the earth with the fruit of righteousness, peace. For those who believe in replacement theology, they see that the church here, is Israel, and they see that this verse is speaking of the people of God who make up the kingdom of God. And don't get this chapter, though, mixed up with Isaiah chapter 5, with the vineyard in chapter 5. As that chapter in chapter 5, the vineyard did not bear abundant fruit. In verse 7 through 9, it says, Has he struck Israel as he struck those who struck him? Or as he slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him? In measure by sending it away, you contended with it. He removes it by his rough wind. In the day of the east wind, therefore by this inequity of Jacob will be covered. And this is all the fruit of taking away his sin. When he makes all the stones the altar, like chalk stones, they are that are beaten to dust. Wooden images and incense altars shall not stand so god has tempered his dealings with israel but not so with those that he used to punish israel and his compassion for the other nations have come to an end and in verse 8 the lord sent judah into captivity to awaken the nation to trust in him and this verse is metaphoric for god's wrath in verse 8 similar to Jeremiah 18, verse 17. And in verse 9, Jacob atoned for his inequity by undergoing punishment from God. And the places used for worship and idols will be destroyed. And an example of an idol was the Asherah tree used in pagan worship. And the Lord shows his mercy to Israel in that he covers their sin. In verse 10, 10 and 11, it says, Yet the fortified city will be desolate, the habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. 
there a calf will feed, and there it will lie down and consume its branches. When its bows are withered, they will be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire, for it is people of no understanding. Therefore he who made them will not have mercy on them, and he who formed them will show them no favor. So fortified city, it represents the oppressors of Judah who were under God's judgment. And the creator will deal a fatal blow to her enemies. And the mighty city will become as brittle as dried out branches. And the city, as we see, it's inhabited by foolish idolaters. And in verse 11, it reminds us that the Lord created them, that God has created these people that he's bringing judgment against. And we see that they would not get to experience the grace of God, which is not deserved by anybody. None of us deserve the grace of God. We only deserve God's wrath. Because of God's love, he shows grace. And you'll find more examples of grace when we push through the book of Isaiah. In verse 12 through 13, um, I did want to make mention too with uh, verse 11, Therefore he who made them, we got to remember that God is creator. And in, in the book of Proverbs chapter 16, verse 4, God even said through his word that, Right here, Proverbs 16, 4, God has, in his word says, The Lord has made all for himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. So, God has a purpose behind those he's even going to judge. In verse 12 and 13 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt. And you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. So it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. And they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. So after the judgment at the end of Daniel's 70th week of her enemies, the faithful remnant of the Israelites will return to their land. And we see the word threshing, and it refers to separating grain by flailing the stalks, as you can find in Ruth chapter 2, verse 17, or olives by beating uh, branches, as you can find in Deuteronomy 24, verse 20. And it's used frequently as a metaphor for separating and gathering God's people from the world. And the river of the Euphrates and the brook is the Radi El Arish, defining the boundaries of the territory of Canaan given by promise to Abraham back in Genesis 15, verse 18. And in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 16, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8 and 9, it shows Assyria and Egypt connected by a highway that leads from both to Jerusalem. And God's people who would have scattered to ex exile will be united in worship of the one God. And in verse 13, the, the prophet Isaiah is reiterating one of the greatest themes, that future worship will be gathered Israel on Mount Zion, as also found in Isaiah 24, verse 23, and Isaiah 25, verse 6 through 10. And as we studied a few weeks back in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10 with the banner, the trumpet is used in summoning the troops. And it's used elsewhere across the Old Testament, back with Moses in Exodus 19, verse 16 through 19, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 3, and 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 15. And mountain in Isaiah 14, 13 is the place of God's throne. And mountain in Isaiah 25, verse 6 and 7, it represents his blessed presence. So that's how you can see that outside of the premillennial viewpoint, there's some that hold to 
the post-millennial viewpoint that the church is the millennium reign and that the uh, the worship of the Lord, the Mount Zion of the Lord is the place of God's throne and uh, mountain is the place of God's throne and mountain also represents his blessed presence. And we're going to look at a verse in our wrap up today in Hebrews that also gives that, you know, viewpoint. And so today we'll wrap up right here. We look at the kingdom of the Lord where Leviathan is defeated. And remember that Leviathan in the Bible practically represents Satan. In Genesis 3, what verse 1 and 5 I mentioned refers to Satan as a serpent. And when you go over to the book of Revelation, I want to read Right before we go to Revelation, I want to reread verse 1. And it says, In that day the Lord will, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. And in, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 through 4, it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the earth, or all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So we see in Revelation chapter 13 what many refer to as the Antichrist emerging out of the sea. And we see that the, the people, they worship the dragon who gave authority to this beast. So when Satan has his ungodly trinity godhead, that, that, that's what it's looking as. And Isaiah prophesies the defeat of Satan when Jesus conquers all. And I want to read one of my favorite verses in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16 verse 20. And it says, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So we remember that Emmanuel is the Prince of Peace. So Jesus is the Prince of Peace who will crush Satan. Amen. And in verse 2 through 6 of Isaiah 27, it shows us that in the kingdom of the Lord, Israel blossoms. And I want to go over to John chapter 15. Verse 1 through 8. And it says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I will abide Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither of can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they shall gather them and throw them in the fire, into the fire." And they be burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So today's chapter, when we read Isaiah 27, it brought 
uh, they brought the passage here that we just read in John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8 to my head. And it, it indicates of the good and productive vine. And when we yield to the care of the Lord, he will care for us as his precious vineyard right now. And we can enjoy the blessings of that care. In Isaiah 27, verse 7 through 9, it shows that Israel will receive mercy in the kingdom of God. In the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 26, it says, And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away godlessness, ungodliness from Jacob. So in the kingdom of the Messiah, this is ultimately fulfilled when all Israel will be saved. And this is one of those reasons and those verses why some argue for the doctrine of replacement theology. They say the church is replaced by, uh, the, that Israel is replaced by the church and all God's elect will come to faith and God's elect is, you know, the Israel. That is a belief that is out there that's held by many. In John chapter 11, verse 51 and 52, it says, Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. And they see Christ's atonement and new obedience on a national level of what Christ accomplishes in a perfect way on behalf of a greater number. And Isaiah 27 verse 10 and 11 shows us that the city of man, the world systems, it lies desolate in the kingdom of the Lord. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20. I'm actually out of water here. So bear with me if my voice is dry. But Romans 1 20 says. For since the creation of the world. His invisible attributes are clearly seen. Having understood by the things that are made even to his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things so man became fools when they thought that they became wise and doesn't it sound like people today that reject god there's many who think you know oh i got uh, you know 10 degrees i got a phd i got this i got that but you know they fall for this foolishness stuff like rejecting biology today and having 80 something whatever amount of genders that they've made up and uh so isaiah 27 to continue on we see it ends with the messiah worshipped in jerusalem in the kingdom of the lord and i want to go over to matthew 24 verse 31 and um as we talked about the trumpet and everything the gathering the summoning of the the troops we see in the Olivet discourse Matthew 24 verse 31 and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other and so in the Olivet discourse we see the trumpet summoning his troops in uh, one more verse Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 and it says but you have come to mount zion into the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels 
to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God and the judge of all to the spirits of just men and made perfect to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and the, to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel so once again as I mentioned with Mount Zion some believe in eschatology that Jesus is going to come back and land right directly on Mount Zion. And others see that everything's symbolic like this. And they see Mount Zion as representing God's presence. And that's going to wrap up our video today. We'll see you next as we look at the word to drunkards. So drunkard politicians is up next. And I hope that you have a great rest of your evening. I'll let you know when the next video will be. God bless.